How are we doing this morning? Come on, come on. Hey, before we re- release the kids to Kids Church, I do have um, a couple quick announcements. Um, first of all, senior camp, senior retreat is coming up. Um, if you are wanting to go to senior camp, get in touch with Pastor Jim and Margaret. There are registration packets at the Connect Center in the back. The registration deadline for that is the 13th. So make sure that we get your information in for that so that you can go to senior camp. Um, The Alive Conference is coming up for youth students. Um, I've been talking about it in youth, but I don't know if I've mentioned it out here in this service yet. The Alive Conference is what it is. is we, We believe that your students can be missionaries on their school campus. So the Alive Conference is training for that, for your students to become prepared to spread the gospel on the biggest campus, on the biggest mission field that there is, our public schools. So we want to make sure your, your kids are prepared for that. Um, small groups are going on. Make sure you're in touch with your small group leader about when you're meeting next. Uh, and let's see here. The evangelism team is going to be doing a trash pickup on the 13th uh, from 5 to 7. So get with... Um, Clint and Kayla, if you're wanting to serve our community, we're going to be picking up trash and knocking on doors uh, and sharing the gospel with people. So get in touch with Pastor Clint and Kayla about that one. And then, um, let's see here, the food ministry. Pastor, or not pastor, sorry, our church administrator, Dave, alluded to this earlier uh, about yesterday being an amazing day. And I'm going to go ahead and ask Craig to come up here. Um, But... Our food ministry serves our community. And so if you want to plug in with our food ministry, they're going to be packing boxes on Friday the 27th, and then the giveaway is going to be on the 28th of this month, or this next month. So, Craig, why don't you share with us what happened yesterday? First of all, we're a little loud, but all right. Good morning, everybody. There's a lot of smiling faces in here, and I'm thankful for each and every one that uh, yesterday was not your normal day is what Dave was getting to. We had a lot of teamwork. We had a lot of things that piled up at at one time. But that song, it says, I depend on you. We had to depend on God yesterday. Yesterday, things went a little haywire here and there. But as we know, it can't always be perfect. But the one thing is that God brought us through it. It's not anything that I did. It's not anything that anybody did. It's we all sat inside. We pray. We always pray. And we set that tone of it's your show, God, because it's not mine. I just, I'm just the one that has the vision. So whenever I c- c- come up here and speak, I want everybody, the whole body to know every time that it's not me. It's we are one together. You guys come together. Kent could come out there and huffed it. I mean, we had car after car after car. They was lined all the way through the beer can alley. It was backed up. That We had people all over the place. And we got a, a thing of bread that we asked this other church, and they brought five carfuls of bread and sweets and all this stuff. So he got dropped right there. And with all the people and everything, we got all, every single bit of the bread and all that stuff gone. We got canned goods gone. We got everything cleaned out of that b- b- building. I mean, everything in an hour. 353 people was fed in an hour. But the main thing came in the middle of, of, of the afternoon. There's a guy that used to go to church over at... Odin. He goes to Pastor Kirk's church now, which isn't a big deal. But whenever he came, he was in and out of jail. He was doing drugs. He was doing all this kind of stuff that was wrong. And he come up and he pulled through the line because he, he wanted to say this. He said, don't think about what the n- number sounds like because it's 666. But that was actually a good a good one for one time because he is 666 days without a drug, without alcohol, without anything whatsoever. And we, as a church, we pull everybody out and we say, 
this is a b b big deal because people don't understand what you may think is small. It's not small to God. God is in every single detail, no matter how big or small. And that's the culture that we're trying to set o over there. And I wanted to say this. Without your, your gifts, your g g giving, without your love, without your time, without all, all that, that room would just be a room. It's not God takes control of it, but without your love, time, and everything else, it would still be a room. Because we started from nothing. And I'm sure a big part, part, part of you know, we started to hand out bags, small bags in Odin, and look where it's at now. In a year, this man here preached at dinner church, and it was an awesome word. He talked about one year ago. One year ago, we was maybe 50, 60 or so. And in a year's time, God turned it around. You see the building. You see things. And I invite you guys. I mean, you, you need to stop and look at it in a different view. I mean... There was all kinds of stuff in there. Clint, K K K K Kayla, put some hard time in there. Of course, Ed and his son, they did a lot, lot, lot of work, Carol and them. There's a lot of people that I could stand up here and, and say that transformed that building into what, into what it is now. It's, it's, it's you guys. You guys have something to be proud about, something to just grab a hold of and see that you just look. We keep getting something more and more. God's hand is on that building, if you guys haven't seen it, all throughout. After church is over, we're going to have a little me me meeting with me and Kim in the gym for anybody. I ask you this. Search your heart and see if that's what you want. We need people. We need quite a few that's, good, that's going, going to say, hey, your vision is mine, too. I, I want to be there. So I inv invite you guys, after church is done, to come and see us inside the gym. Thanks, Craig. Thank you, Craig. <clears throat> come on. And then one more announcement, because I forgot, and I have people who to remind me. Tonight is our family movie night. It is going to be a blast. Uh, if you haven't already invited friends, please invite friends to that. Uh, that is going to be an amazing time. It starts at 5 uh, o'clock, and it's going to be a good time of just fellowship with, with our church family, but also our community. So please come to that and invite all your friends to that. We're going to have so much fun uh, watching a family-friendly movie. You know, there, there's not a lot of that anymore. And so we're, we're happy that we're able to be a place, you know, tonight where people can come and hang out at, with our families and watch something that is family friendly and don't have to worry about anything for, the, the, for that two hours that they're there or however long it is. So please come to that. All right, kids. Yes. What are we watching? Despicable Me. Despicable me. All right. All right. I know, I know Jake is excited about that one. So, hey. All right. Hey, kids, you can go to kids' church. All right, I've got something important to share with you this morning. A man visited his doctor, and the doctor checked him over before commenting, it looks like you get a fair good amount of exercise. The man replied, oh yeah, in fact, just the other day, I walked five miles over rugged terrain as I climbed over rocks and trees. Also waded along the edges of a lake, pushing my way through t tall thistles. 
and it even slid down the sandy slopes while getting sand all in my eyes. The doctor was quite impressed and said, well, you are certainly a dedicated outdoor enthusiast. The man replied, not really, doctor. I'm just a really bad golfer. All right. All right. Uh, this morning, I want to talk to you for just a little bit about um, worship and being what the Bible calls a true worshiper. So this morning, if you will, uh, turn with me to um, John chapter 4. And we're going to find ourselves in the middle of a conversation that Jesus was having with a woman. Um, many of us know her as the woman at the well. And so we're going to find ourselves in the middle of this conversation. What happens is Jesus and his disciples are headed on a journey, and they go through a place called Samaria. And this is not a place that they would normally find themselves at because Jews and the Samaritans didn't really mix well together. And Jesus is having this conversation with this woman, and, and what happens is Jesus begins to tell her everything that she's ever done. And, and we're going to find ourselves right after this where she says, I can see that you're a prophet. And if, 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 you, if, you, if you're choosing what, which version you can read from today, I'm in the New King James. Um, but we're going to start in verse 20. And it says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. This is the woman speaking. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, it is now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. This morning, we're going to talk about being true worshipers. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you are holy and that you're mighty. And Lord, I thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for today. I pray, Lord, that you would give me the words to speak today, Lord, that you would anoint my tongue to speak the words from your throne, God, but you would anoint ears to hear what you're saying. Lord, don't let me speak through. Let you be the one who speaks today, God. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there are a lot of places and a lot of churches um, who put restrictions on worship. If you've ever been around Pastor Jim and Margaret, they talk about a lot about uh, when they were part of the Church of Christ. And it, you may not know this, but the Church of Christ doesn't believe in instrumental worship. They believe that you shouldn't have instruments in your worship. It should just be you and you alone. You worship with your voice, and that's it. Obviously, we don't believe that because we have instruments. You know, we believe that you can worship however, however you need to. But there are so many people and, and churches and organizations that will restrict your worship. But when we read the passage that we just read, it, it seems that Jesus is inferring that there is more to worship than just the place or just the location. Because the big argument that they were having was about location. There has to be more about worshiping God. Because when we think of worship, a lot of times we people get this idea of, well, worship is for at church. When we go to church, we're going to sing four or five songs. You know, if Pastor Josh is leading, maybe eight. You know, we're going to just keep singing songs, and we're going to, and we're going to, and we do it just before the just before the sermon, and and it just gets us ready, gets our hearts ready to receive the word. And and people will tend tend to think that you worship at church because it's the right thing to do. But there has to be more about worshiping God just because it's the right thing to do. So we, we're going to try and to dissect this a little bit and, and talk about what Jesus is saying here. The first problem that we see with the woman at the well and her, and her thinking about worship is, is location. In this passage of Scripture, we get to see that the fact that the Jews and Samaritans obviously disagree on the location of their worship. Um, in, verse, in, in, in this verse 20, she says... You Jews think you have to worship in the temple. We think we have to worship on this mountain. Well, this mountain is the place that held Jacob well, Jacob's well. 
And Jacob's well is the same place that J- Jacob bought this piece of land and gave it to his son, Joseph. And so this is it's the same Jacob of the Old Testament, the one who wrestled with God. And, and so there, both of these places are, are places that we have marked as holy sites now at this day and time. There's no doubt that both of these places are valuable uh, to both the, the religious and the political culture. But Jesus does not seem concerned with the location of his response. In verse 21, he says, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So what's Jesus saying? Jesus is simply saying that it doesn't matter where you worship. Your worship is not tied to a location. Worship isn't a 30 to 45 minute activity that happens before a pastor gets up and preaches. Worship is something that you do to connect you to the Father. Jesus gave two aspects of what God is looking for in a worshiper in verse 23. He says, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. I want us to think about that. Spirit. Let's look at that first one. God is looking for people who worship in spirit. What does that mean? Well, in reality, it means two things. The first means that you worship out of your spirit. In 1 Thessalonians, uh, Paul says this. He says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are a human, in case you didn't know. You have a body a soul, and a spirit. I think the body is the obvious part. It's the part that we, when we get up and we look in the mirror, it's the part that we see. Your body is what everyone sees. It's temporary. And one day it will return to dust as it was made from dust. And your soul is your mind. It's how you think. It's how you reason. It's where your emotions reside. It's where your personality lies. But your spirit is the core of who you are. It is what separates man from the rest of creation. Your spirit is how we connect to God. It is how we're able to experience God in the spirit realm. Now when I say spirit realm, that can kind of be a little weird. But how many of you felt the presence of God this morning? That's what I'm talking about. We can feel the presence of God because the spirit... Because Jesus says that God is spirit in verse 24, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. That that part of God is spirit, when our spirit connects to the spirit of God, something happens. Your spirit is the part that connects you to who God is. Without that, we lack. Without Without being spiritual, without having a spirit within us, we lack. The point of worship, the point of salvation, all of it is lacking. Salvation can't be for you if you don't have a spirit. Having a spirit within you is what connects you to God. And it's what makes you different from all of all the rest of creation. Now the second meaning of worshiping in spirit means, means that we worship in the spirit. We worship in the Holy Spirit. This is how you take things to a deeper level. To worship in the spirit is to partner with the Holy Spirit. To allow the Holy Spirit to flow through you. If you listen closely during our worship sessions, you will often hear people praying in tongues. This is people worshiping and partnering with the Holy Spirit. And and people can get a little weirded out when we start talking about speaking in tongues. But the reality is what what we're doing is we're allowing the Holy Spirit to flow through us. We're, 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 and I said this last night at dinner church, but Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 2, for one who speaks of a tongue, speaks in a tongue, speaks not to men, but to God. So when we're praying in the Spirit, you're not praying for others to hear, you're praying for the Father to hear. You're praying not, for, not, not so that you know what you're saying. Or I think sometimes when, we, when we're praying out loud, some people feel the pressure to be 
elegant when they're praying. Like some people feel the pressure to make it sound like, like, like they're, you know, Benny Hinn or, you know, Jimmy Swaggart. You don't have to be them, okay? You, you are who God created you to be. You don't have to put on a front when you're praying to God, okay? You can be you. But he also says, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. So no man, when we pray in the Spirit, no man, it's not for any, anybody else, it's for someone, it's for God, for you and God. He then later says that when you pray in, pray in tongues, you're building yourself up. And you need that. Now if you were at dinner church last night, you heard me say that prophecy is better because that's what Paul said. That prof, I wish you would prophesy because it builds up the whole church. But you're part of that church. So you need to pray in tongues. If you have that gift, please use it and exercise it. If you don't have that gift, please seek it. And he will give it to you. The truth is that when we partner our worship with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, our worship becomes enhanced. And only God gets the glory. And, and the reason I say that is because how many times, how many times, oh, like, sometimes what you say in worship or even what you're praying can get twisted by the enemy. It can. There, there's this pastor that, I, I heard this when I was listening to one of his sermons. What he said was, you know, there are certain people that when, they, when they're going through a hard time, all they will do is turn up a worship song and start singing it. And I had this thought, this, past, this is what the pastor said, I had this thought about when, we, when we're worshiping and we're singing songs that sometimes the enemy would rather you do that than pray in the Spirit. Because, you see, Satan, before he became the enemy, was the worship leader of heaven. And his job was to lead all of the angels in worship of God. At one point, Satan sung, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We sing oftentimes, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Satan is familiar and comfortable with those words. Satan knows he's holy. But when we pray in the Spirit, even the enemy can't understand it. It's mysteries in the Spirit. It's not for us, it's for God. God gets the glory. God gets the praise and all the honor. So when we're praying in the Spirit, we get to have that. We have that moment where it's not for us, it's for God. God gets the glory, but in return, He builds us up because we're praying in His Spirit. If we go back to verse 23, He says, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. The second point Jesus makes is that God is pe- looking for people to worship Him in truth. Now, what does it mean to worship out of truth? Well, first, it means that we worship in the name of Jesus. In the book of John, chapter 14, Jesus gives us this, this little look into who He is. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is saying, if you want to worship God, God is looking for people who will worship Him in me. I am the truth. And so many times we worship God out of ourselves. We'll say, you know what, God? I'll worship you. And that's it. But, but God's looking for people who will say, God, I will worship you because of who you are. There's this, there's this old song. It's, it says, because of who you are, I'll give you glory. Because of who you are, I'll give you praise. Because of who you are, I will lift my voice and sing. I will worship you because of who you are. And that is simply what God is looking for. People who will worship Him out of spirit and truth. When we worship God out of truth, we worship him, we're worshiping Him because of who He is. Not because other people are doing it. It is so easy to worship here. It's so easy to worship at dinner church. Because there are so many people around me who are doing the same thing. They're worshiping. But God says, no, I'm looking for people who will worship me in truth. Because it's easy to worship here, but what happens on Tuesday morning when that one coworker says something that crosses you? If we're not worshiping in truth, then we miss out on worship. We're missing out on the point of our worship.
It also means that we worship out of the truth of who God has revealed himself as. There was a song. You see, worship comes out of your revelation of who God is to you. And there's a song that has become very, very popular. It became popular around 2018, 2019. You're all probably familiar with it. We sing it here sometimes. It's called Waymaker. And when that song came out, it took churches by storm. And, and if I could say the words and you would sing the rest of it. You know, Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, Light in the Darkness, My God, that is who you are. And I wonder why that song became so popular. It's because people began to worship God out of the revelation that He is that. So many times people were able to say, you know what? He was a miracle worker for me. He has kept His promises. He has been that. Around the same time, there was another song that came out called Gyra by Maverick City. And that became a popular song. Because so many people were like, you know what? That is my God. He has been a provider for me. He is Jehovah Jireh. And when we begin to worship out of our revelation of who God is, it means more to you. If you, worship out of, if you worship God out of the truth of who He has revealed Himself to be to you, it means that much more to you. If not, you're just standing around singing a song. And the world does that. The world just stands around and sings songs. People, you know, I'm, I'm not dogging on you if you go to concerts. I like music too. But there are people who will go to concerts and all that they will do is just stand there and sing a song that someone else wrote. And it really means nothing to them. But they enjoy it. But here, in this place, we're singing songs and we're connecting ourselves to the Father. We're connecting ourselves with the throne room of heaven where worship is going on 24-7. And it means that much more to us when we realize He is my provider. He is a way maker. He is the vine. When you realize that, it means more to you. And it, and it gets you on a deeper level. When you begin to worship God because of who He has already revealed Himself to be, He will begin to reveal Himself to you in new ways. You're like, okay, maybe, maybe you know what, maybe Cody is sitting here and he's like, you know what, God, you have been a provider for me, so I'll worship you because you've been a provider. And God says this, you know what, now that you've grasped that I'm a provider, I'm going to show you this side of me because I have this to offer too. The angels circle around the throne of God, and every time they look at him, they see a different aspect of who he is. And if they can do that, being in heaven and always getting a new revelation of who God is, then here on earth we can always get a new revelation too. There is no more separation. When the veil was torn, you are now are able to get a revelation of who God is daily. Something new. Something different. If God has revealed himself to be a good father to you, then worship him for being that good father. If God has revealed himself as a healer to you, then worship him for being that healer. If God has revealed himself to be a great provider, then worship him for, for providing during your lowest times. We worship God out of who He has revealed Himself to be to us. But if you're going through a hard season in your life, and it's hard and you don't know what's lying ahead of you, worship God for who He is, outside of what you already know. Maybe you don't know Him to be a healer, and you need healing. There are people in this room and people around you who will testify that he is a healer. And because he's done it before, he will do it again. So worship God because he is a healer, even if you don't already see it. If you need provision in your life, if maybe you're struggling, maybe your finances aren't there, maybe, you don't, maybe God has never been a provider for you before, get ready, honey, he will. It's going to happen. Worship him out of that. Worship God out of who you need Him to be. Sometimes, there, there's one time in Scripture, and, and people will always tell you, don't test God, and I agree with that. Don't do stuff just because God said, don't do it and test Him. But there are times when God says, test me on this, and you will see. Test me on this, and you will see. If you've heard that I'm a provider, trust me to be one. If you've heard that I'm a healer, trust me to be one. Even if you don't see it now, know that I will do it because that is who I am. 
You see, a lot of the names that we have for God in Scripture, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, all of these, all of these names, God only gave himself one of them, Jehovah Rapha. The rest of them were attributed to him by the people that worshipped him. But only one time, besides Yahweh or Jehovah, God said, I am that I am. So that's the, the, name, the name Yahweh. Jehovah is the translation of that. But Jehovah Rapha is the only time that he says, I am your healer. The rest of the time, people attributed those names to him. Why? Because they got a revelation of that as part of who he is. If you don't already see provision in your life, believe that Jehovah Jireh is there. If you don't believe that God can move the mountains and part the seas, believe that El Shaddai is there. El Shaddai is the name of the all-powerful, almighty one. You see, there's, there's this, I heard a pastor do this teaching on it, and he said, Elohim, which is the, if you read in, in the book of Genesis, and God created, and Elohim created, that's the all-powerful God. And then he said, but then God spoke to Moses and said, part the seas. That was El Shaddai. And El Shaddai means the God who goes outside of nature and time and space. The God who can change things. The God who can make, make things happen in an instance that go beyond natural law. Sometimes we get so busy th knowing God as Elohim that we forget that he's El Shaddai too. We forget that, you know what, even though all, all common sense says, no, this can't happen, God says, do you trust me enough to know that it will? My grandfather was diagnosed with cancer in 2019. And they, they did not give him a very good report. And he did not want to re receive treatment at all. He said, I'm done, I'm not doing it. And he was heartbroken because my grandmother uh, had Alzheimer's, dementia, at the time. And she was struggling, and he had promised her when they got married that he would never put her in a nursing home. And he, said, and he was like, now I'm broken because I cannot take care of myself, so I can't take care of her either. And he was her caregiver. Well, my grandpa decided to go ahead and get treatment. And that he was diagnosed with cancer in October. And I believe it was by March they said he was cancer free. And praise God. Praise God. My grandmother died in February of 2020. By March, my grandpa was healed. Was, was healed. And every time he goes into the doctor for his checkups, they say, yeah, no, it's, it's still gone. There's no signs of it. And... I remember sitting in the hospital room with my grandpa when I found out he had just been diagnosed with it. Well, he didn't even know for sure. He just, he just said, I know it is. I know it is. And the report came back that it was cancerous and it had, it had spread. And my grandpa was broken and had lost all hope, it seemed like. But I wasn't going to take that for an answer because I wasn't ready for him to go. I knew that my grandma was going to be passing shortly. I, I knew that at, at some point it was going to happen soon. Her, her, she had begun to deteriorate. She didn't recognize who I was when I came, to, came over to the house. And so I knew that, that, I knew that time was, the time was coming. But for my grandpa, it was instant. And I said, no, I'm not accepting this. And I began to pray and I said, God, I know you can heal. And part of the reason I know he could heal is because in 2017, I had a car accident. And what happened was I broke my ankle. And I overheard, they didn't tell me this directly, but I overheard someone say as they were walking out of a room that I was in, he may not walk again with a, without assistance. He may not walk again without assistance, a brace or something. I was sitting in the fellowship hall of Refuge Church in Jonesboro, Ar Jonesboro Arkansas, in 20, it was probably, it was the end of 2017, and we were having a, a service, a kid's service, I was helping out in kids' ministry, and Pastor Angie, who, was the, who is the kid's pastor at Refuge Church, said, 
we're going to have all these kids pray for each other. Praying for healing and praying for everything. And there were these two kids that came up, Seth and Jaden. And what they did was they laid their hands on me. And the moment they laid their hands on me, my ankle popped. I haven't worn a brace since. And praise God. So I was able to worship God out of the revelation that he is a healer. On behalf of someone else. Sometimes we also think that we can only worship for ourselves. That worship is a one-way street where it's between me and God and me and God alone. But there are times where you're in the secret place where your prayer can become part of your worship. And you can pray for people and believe that God will heal them and God will do stuff and provide for them. I love seeing text messages with updates of prayers. People will text in to our to, to that number that we have for, for announcements, and they'll say, pray for me with this. And I love seeing the updates. Because most of the time it has to do with medical issues. And when there's an update that things have been getting better, I know it's because there have been people praying about it. There are people who have gone before the throne of God, and they've prayed Him and worshipped Him out of what they already know Him to be. Sometimes you have to worship God out of who you don't know Him to be too. To truly know what truthful worship is, we have to know what truthful worship isn't. And truthful worship isn't self-centered. As a matter of fact, it's completely selfless. Worship is about being all-consumed by the all-powerful God. And allowing Him to have His hand over and in your life. If you think that worship is about you, you have it all wrong. You have a part, but it's not about you. Worship isn't about making you feel good. It's not. Can you feel good afterwards? Yes. But it's not about you feeling good. Truthful worship isn't just good music. You know what? We have one of the best worship teams in the world. We do. We have people who, who they, they practice what God, the gifts that God has given them, and they use it to glorify Him. The anointing that falls in this room when they play together and they begin to lead us into worship is different than what you'll find at a thousand different churches. You won't always feel this when you're somewhere else. We have a powerful and anointed team, but worship isn't just about the good music. I love to sing the songs. I like to dance. I like to have fun. I like to shout. I want to do all the things that's around worship, but that's not what worship is. You see, now they are a great segue into what worship, worship truly is. But if your worship hinges on the songs being sung, then it's not really worship. If you have to worship, if, if when you are alone in the secret place, if you're alone, if you're, if you're with God, and you're like, you know what, God, I'm setting aside this time to worship you, and you turn on Spotify or Apple Music or whatever, and you put on songs, and the only thing that happens during that worship point, that worship moment, is you're singing the words of someone else, then you're not worshiping out of, you, out of your heart. I can worship God all I want out of songs that someone else said. I can sing songs all day. But I want God to see my heart. I want to worship God out of who I know who He is, out of who He has been for me, and so sometimes you have to let out the song in your heart. Maybe you're not, maybe you don't sing, okay? Sing anyway. Maybe, well, it doesn't sound good. Well, you know what? When you're by yourself, sing however loud you want. You're not going to be bothering anybody but yourself. God gave you that voice, use it. Truthful worship isn't just about being emotional. When you are in the secret place and God touches you and you begin to cry, it's different. It is different. And so if you, if you don't have that, if you don't have, if there's something that has been hindering you from having that moment, I pray that it would happen for you because it is different. Last October, for the first time in years, I cried during worship. Years. In 2017, when I had that wreck, I mentioned it last night, my brother passed away. And that was hard. It's hard sitting there, you know, 
knowing that your brother is no longer there. And it hardened my heart. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to share this testimony with you. It hardened my heart. It did. I became hard, and I, I still did ministry, and I still love God, and I worship God and all that, but I hadn't cried in the presence of God since from that day. I hadn't done it. And when we moved here, Pastor Josh would kind of joke around, but not really. He would lay his hand on my shoulder and say, Lord, I pray that you give him the gift of tears. I've known Pastor Josh since, since after, 20, after March of 2017. When they moved to Arkansas, I met them. That was after the wreck. So Pastor Josh knows that I hadn't been an emotional person. I hadn't really cried at all. And he would pray that. And in October, I, I began crying during worship sessions, and, and in the presence of God, I began to weep. In November, it was like, God, turn, turn, turn it up. I would do it, like, every so often, but, like, that month of November, it was like every time I was in the presence of God, I just cried. I began to weep. And there are moments like that when the Holy Spirit hits me. You know, I'm, 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 not, I'm really not that, much, that emotional. I'm really not. But in the presence of God, things change. It doesn't matter how hard my exterior is when on the inside he's, he's molding the clay. He can get you to that point. Now, I'm about, I'm about to close, so if you want to put some music on, you can. But truthful worship is also powerful worship. I want us to turn to the book of Acts. In chapter 16. This is another very familiar passage of scripture for a lot of us. And it's the passage of Paul and Silas in the prison cell. I'm going to read starting in verse 20. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. Hallelujah. And when they, laid, and when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them in the innermost prison and fastened their feet into the stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were loosed. Your worship is powerful worship. Not only will your worship loosen your chains, but they will happen to loosen the chains of the people around you. Your worship isn't just for you. When you begin to worship God, other people will become blessed too. Now, in order for this passage, I I really think in order for this passage to strike you as much as it does me, you have to understand what the inner prison was. You see, the inner prison was where the sewage ran. They didn't have plumbing the way that we have it now. So what would happen is all the sewage and all the drainage would flow into the inner part of the prison. And that's where they would keep people who had done the the worst crimes. And see, this inner prison was dirty and disgusting. It was a lowly place. It was a place where people wouldn't find themselves unless they had done something truly awful. And Paul and Silas, the only thing they were guilty of was preaching the gospel. And they found themselves there in the inner prison. When you find yourself at the lowest point, when you find yourself dirty and disgusting, your worship begins to lose, the, lose, lose those chains. You see, the Bible says that all the chains and all the doors were open because Paul and Silas began worshiping. Now, I don't, now if this is just me thinking, but if, if there are people worshiping God around you, other people typically join in. See, I don't think it was just Paul and Silas that were worshiping. I think at some point, the other prisoners got a hold of what they were doing. And they began to worship with them. 
as much as worship is one-on-one, it is for a corporate body as well. The Bible says every joint supplies. If every joint is worshiping, if everyone is together in their worship, something miraculous can happen. Chains will begin to fall off. There are people that I know. I have this friend. His name's Cody. It's not one of the Cody's we have here. We got a lot of Cody's in the world. All right. This guy named Cody. I'm going to tell you a little bit of his story. You see, Cody, he grew up in church and hated the church. He got hurt. Cody was a homosexual. That's who he was. He hated the church and ran one way, and that's where he found himself. Well, at a certain point, Cody ended up going to church. My friend invited him and said, you know what, I'm going to check it out. Cody now has a big following on TikTok, believe it or not, where he does Bible trivia and tells stories about who God really is. God took Cody out of homosexuality and restored him. Cody now has, a, has gone to Bible college. He's graduated from seminary. He's on staff at one of the biggest church in Jones, churches in Jonesboro, Arkansas as a media pastor. He is doing it. He is, he, he is what God has... Like when, when we talk about breaking chains of people around us, Cody is a, is a testimony of that. Your worship can bring people out of the place that they're in. It really can. Your worship can also last generations. I am the product of a praying grandma. I am the product of a praying grandpa. I'm a product of a praying mom and dad. Some of you may say, well, my parents weren't in church. You know what? Maybe not, but there's someone in your life that prayed for you before you ever got to that point. I'm thankful for my great-grandparents. Lonel F. Fry and Gladys Fry, who were pastors at Swift and First Assembly of God, who taught my grandma how to pray. My grandma who taught my mom how to pray. My parents who taught me how to pray and how to worship and how to be in those moments with God. Without that, I wouldn't be here. I'm the product of prayer and worship. You as well are the product of prayer and worship. Believe it or not, someone prayed for you to be here today. Whether it was yesterday or 3,000 yesterday, someone prayed for you to be here. Truthful worship is a weapon. There's a story in, in the Old Testament in 2 Chronicles where the nation of Judah is being attacked by three different armies. The king at the time, his name was Jehoshaphat, and he worshipped God and claimed that God would be his guidance. When he got done praying and worshipping, the Bible records that the prophet of the Lord came to him and gave him a word, and this word was this, station yourselves and you won't need to fight. You won't have to fight this battle. And they did. They sat and they watched while their enemies destroyed themselves out of one man's worship. An entire nation was spared that day. Truthful worship is your connection to heaven. And when we worship, we join in on the song of heaven. There are right now in heaven people saying, holy, holy, holy. Angels circling around the throne saying, you are worthy the lamb that was slain. And we get to join in on that song. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I have a question for you this morning. That question is simply this. Where do you worship from? Do you worship out of a revelation that Jesus Christ is your Savior? Maybe you don't. Maybe Jesus hasn't revealed himself as a Savior to you yet. But you want that revelation. You want to say, you know what, Jesus, I believe that you are a Savior. So I'm putting my trust and my faith in you today. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up? God 
Gott sie sei hin. Well, this morning as a church family, can we just pray this together? Dear Jesus, thank you that you are holy and set apart. Jesus, I believe that you are Lord and Savior. And I choose to worship you because of that today. I choose to make you my Savior. And I will live that way the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. I got two questions for you this morning. The first is this. Would you consider yourself a true worshiper? And if not, do you want to be? You see, being a true worshiper means that you worship God no matter the circumstance. And that you worship Him out of spirit and truth. And you connect your spirit with His. And you worship Him, worship him for who He is. And this morning, if you're willing to make a commitment to worshiping God as a true worshiper, would you stand? If you need special prayer this morning, please come and we will pray with you. The altars are open if you need to pray or you need special prayer. But as a church family, we're just gonna, I'm going to pray and I'm going to bless us. And if you are wanting to make yourself and say, God, you know what? I want to be a true worshiper. I want to worship you in spirit and in truth. Just agree with this. Receive it. And, and God's going to start taking you there. Your worship probably won't change overnight, but God's going to start taking you there. He's going to start giving you opportunities to worship. He's going to start bringing you deeper with Him. And so just receive this and agree with it if, if it's what you want. If you need a special prayer, come and we will pray with you. Father God, I thank you. Lord, that you are calling us into a deeper place of worship, God. You're calling us to become true worshipers, God, as you said. That you are seeking people to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we make a commitment to that this morning. Holy Spirit, would you move over our people, God? Would you bless us? Would you take us deeper? Give us opportunities to worship you, God, and reveal yourself to us in different ways. Lord, I bless your people this morning. I pray that as we leave this place, that we would experience your presence again and again. And that we would find ourselves at the feet of King Jesus. Loving you and worshiping you with all the days of our life. Lord, I bless your people as they go. I pray that they would feel your hand upon them the rest of this week and beyond. That they would experience you in mighty ways. We love you and praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Hey, I'd like to personally thank each one of you for tuning into our YouTube channel today. Make sure you subscribe, share it with a friend, and I'll see you next Sunday morning at 10 a.m.